marketing. Joe talked about it this morning. I've talked to several of you throughout the day about marketing. It's sort of this enigma. You know you got to do it, but there's not just that easy button that Staples seems to think exists. If only there was just a simple plan, do this, then that, then that, and you'll be successful, well, we'd all be doing it, right? From being in marketing for many years myself, I've found that there is no simple way, but that there is one thing that you can always count on working, and that is asking people who've done it before and learning from what they've learned and taking their advice, trying to adapt it to what you're doing and evolving from there. And then sharing that wisdom that you learn on with other people because of course teaching is the best way to learn. And so hopefully today you'll learn something from our four excellent panelists here today to talk about marketing. And then you'll go home and you'll be that sort of mentor as well to pass along your knowledge to other coaches, to other people in business. Because at the end of the day, running a coaching business is a business. And so whether you are thinking about it as simply taking someone to a finish line or getting somebody off the couch or getting somebody to the Olympics, at the end of the day, you are running a business. And so we've got, some, we've got four, four good uh, perspectives, I think is probably the, a good word. Because what we tried to do, instead of just having uh, four coaches, we're really lucky. Ali Dodge, on the end, <clears throat> Ali Dodge brings the perspective of a professional marketing consultant. Ali worked for over 10 years. <laughs> Ali worked for over 10 years at Vail Resorts, which, as some of you know, has a couple ski resorts uh, around. And they are well, well known for their marketing. If you've ever gone to one, you then get the email because you should go back, or you should go to another one, or you should use the hotel, or you should. It's an incredible process. And Allie had a big hand in creating that over the last 10 years at Vail. Now, though, <clears throat> she's working as a consultant with small and medium sized businesses. And you know, I'll let her talk more about that change and the difference. But what I really like about Allie is she brings that passion for every business, regardless of whether it's Vail Resort size or whether it's just starting out. And she has some great insights into what makes marketing work. Next to Allie, we have <clears throat> Mike. Mike is a coach. Mike Ritchie, you may have heard of D3 Multisport, I believe 15 years, mm -hmm. and today over thir or 13 coaches, a yep. couple hundred athletes based out of here in Boulder. In fact, CU, uh, you've, you've got the, uh, let's see, what was it, 2013 USA Triathlon Coach of the Year for taking the CU collegiate team to four consecutive national titles. Awesome. So, it's a good place to be right here in CU. Thank you. And next to Mike, Nicole. Nicole DeBoom, <clears throat> 10 years ago, professional triathlete, transitioned 10 years ago to becoming an entrepreneur. And some of you probably can, can understand that. You've gone from being a professional athlete or spending a lot of time being an athlete to now being an entrepreneur. And so bringing that perspective of former pro, entrepreneur, product marketer, Nicole recognized the need for female-specific clothing in endurance sports and started Skirt Sports 10 years ago. And today, it's, it's definitely one of the most well-known brands in the endurance industry, which is a niche industry, but yet you've been able to take it into the broader market of running and really created a brand for yourself. Hugh Williams brings the perspective of a public relations professional. Hugh is Senior Vice President for Weber Shandwick, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but is probably the biggest PR firm in the world. That's a lot of PR. <laughs> and I just helped him out. 
You uh, probably may have seen, if you've been in the world of triathlon for long enough, you probably saw the degree deodorant campaigns from Everyman to Iron Man. That was huge. Most recently, you may have seen the chocolate milk campaigns around Heinz Ward, Miranda Carefrey, Apollo Ono. That was huge. So understanding the endurance market and how you build a brand and take, whether it's a product, a business, an athlete, take them to the next level, Hugh brings a perspective of that PR professional. The way we're going to do this, I have several questions. Don't worry, they don't know what they are. No, nope, I did. Give them a little heads up. I'll go through a couple questions, but you guys be writing down some questions that you want to ask. Because I really want to be able to open this up to some Q&A from you. So think about what questions you're going to have. We'll go through the questions that I have and then open it up to the audience. So, we'll start this off. And this question, we'll start with you, Mike. Sure. Growing a business requires some amount of marketing. Oh, do we all agree? Okay. But according to the survey that we just recently did, even the most successful coaches don't spend more than 90 minutes a week on marketing. And that's not a surprise because who has time to do marketing? and yet you know you need to spend time on marketing. So based on your experience, Mike, how do you recommend approaching this classic chicken and egg situation? Okay, great question. I think um, you need to throw away the idea that you're a nine to five worker when you have your own business, you're an entrepreneur. I think it's a, sometimes 18 hours a day or whatever, and, and that's the way I approached it from the beginning. And if you add up 18 times five days a week, that's 90 hours a week. I probably started it six or seven days, you know, 16, 17 hours a day, um, sun up to sundown. And I don't, um, you know, I think that a lot of that is marketing in, in terms of when you're starting a business and, and you know, right? And um, 90 minutes is not gonna get it done, I think, but <laughs> that's my perspective of it. But if I had 90 minutes, um, it would definitely be content driven toward a website and, and, and free information. And I know Joe, Joe talked about this, um, and so did Jeff Bollet about giving away you know, give away the workouts, give away the information, because I think that draws people to you. So it's definitely, if it's 90 minutes, it's content driven, it's articles, it's things like that are gonna draw people to your website and give you credibility in terms of, this guy knows what he's talking about. Because if you don't do that, they're just gonna bypass you to the next website that does get the, give them the information to help them, you know, reach their goals. Ali, when you're talking to businesses just starting out, how do you advise them? I absolutely think that trying to put your efforts into one activity that has multiple concentric circles of impact is the most important thing. So rather than spending a lot of time copiously writing out an email to send to one person, spend that same amount of time writing content for your website or content for Facebook using search terms that are gonna get picked up by Google. Because then you get that one-two punch. You've not only created a great piece of content for your clients, but it's also for prospective clients as they come to find you. So think about those multiple, triple, quadruple impact things that you can do as you're doing one, one activity when it comes to marketing. Nicole, what advice would you give? You started your own business. How did you balance? Uh, the different functions of the business? No, how did you balance doing the marketing and at the same time doing the business? You know, um, I accidentally started a business. I had an idea. Many of you probably have ideas, right? And um, I decided I would do, the first thing I would do is see if I wasn't the only person that liked that idea, because if I was, then I didn't have anything, right? So I tested and essentially marketed my idea by using it uh, first and foremost in the arena it should be used for. Uh, and to give you a little more detail, I created the first ever running skirt. This was back in 2004. People were like, what the, what is that? What's she wearing? And I tested it when I was still racing actually as a professional because my philosophy was don't quit your day job. Um, and I think that might be another good lesson for you guys. Until your business starts to take off, a lot of people will jump in full steam ahead and think I got this thing. But I said, I'm just gonna keep racing and, and maybe I can test this thing while I'm out there. So I actually marketed my skirt accidentally during the uh, 2004 Ironman Wisconsin, a race that I won wearing a prototype of what would later become my company. 
So sometimes I think it's dumb luck or hard work or uh, forces colliding that get you there in marketing as well. And it's having an open mind to continue to move those things forward. You know, marketing is not, is, it's about creating a bit of a plan, but then it's also about going where the momentum is. And I think that's really important. You may, you may think that a certain way to market your business is the way to go, but all of a sudden you're getting all these other clients from something else. And um, you need to recognize that there's an opportunity there as well. <laughs> Great. Did you want to? Yeah, just to add on, just to build on Mike's point, um, I think there was a survey conducted among you guys um, that came up with some really uh, useful insights. And one is, you know, you don't have much time. And two is, uh, not all of you have a great deal of money. So just focusing on the social media aspect, I think if your time and, and money is tight, uh, that's a really effective way to, to build brand awareness, to build your credibility, to acquire clients uh, and keep the existing clients. Um, and just a kind of a few quick tips if, you know, you only have so much time and you wanted to just focus on social media, um, that is, you know, carve out, um, you know, make a calendar appointment, you know, a specific time each day or once a week, probably more often than once a week, where you're going to spend that time, invest that time uh, in engaging, engaging authentically with your existing clients, with potential clients. Um, Mike talked about content. Um, and when you think about sharing content socially, don't always think that needs to be original content. Um, that can also be um, you know, you, you guys are obviously, you know, reading Traffic Magazine, Janae, um, Lava, you know, um, you know, other third-party resources and engaging in it or liking it. Think about that as content that you can uh, engage with as well, share that out as your voice. Um, and then also another kind of quick tip uh, in making sure, you know, you're, you're being really efficient is there are lots of kind of free uh, social media tools out there like Hootsuite, um, with, that give you the ability to kind of uh, monitor multiple kind of keywords that are relevant to you and your business and your clients, uh, and also, um, you know, schedule, you know, social media to, to, to push out as well. So look out for those kind of free social media tools to, to really help make your life a lot easier. Social media is a great, a great point, and I just want to jump to, to that question because I know that social media is at the top of everybody's mind, but it's a huge time suck. And so... How do you leverage social media to find new customers and engage those current customers without losing your mind or wasting your time? So, good ideas, Hootsuite, excellent. Nicole, what would you say on, on social media? Well, I just kind of want to keep hearing Hugh talk because he's got the accent. It's like, hello, I'm entranced. Um, so, Skirt Sports, we definitely see the benefit of social media and it used to be free. And then Facebook screwed us, right? We're all so entitled. Um, you know, you spend all your time building community, and I think that's the really cool thing about social media because you get a chance to be totally authentic, and you might flop, oh well, or you might have some huge wins. But uh, you need to be out there, and you need to be consistent. A couple quick examples. Um, so we built a Facebook community. We have about close to 25,000 fans on Facebook. Well, now that Facebook changed all their rules, we put a post out and like 100 people see it, unless we pay for it, right? So um, these are tough things. So you go, okay, now I have to find a budget for that. So then which posts are the most important ones to boost and put a little money into? So <clears throat> for instance, I posted that I was speaking here and I got 12 likes. No, no offense to uh -huh. the summit, but it wasn't as engaging of, uh, you know, posts that women were like, oh my God, I have to have that. So I didn't boost that one, I'm sorry. You didn't give me a budget anyway. Um, but on April Fool's Day, we put out an email and then we did it on, uh, put out a Facebook post about a new innovative product. And it was for that woman who when she's gotta go, she's gotta go. The new trapdoor skirt. <laughs> and the image was like two women standing there and they were ha ha ha, and there was like a stream of fake pee coming out. Like you can just go wherever you want, and um, and you know it resonated because a it was a joke, but b that's actually sort of a problem for women a lot of times. Um, and we got uh, thousands of likes. It went crazy. Then we boosted it. It doubled. I mean, those are the kinds of things where we sent people 
So then you're leveraging it. We sent people to a survey monkey link and said, would you like to see us make this product? And we had over a thousand people say they would crowdfund the trapdoor skirt. So what do you think we're doing? What do you think we're gonna be doing this fall? So, you know, good examples of like, there, you have to roll with the changing tide of social media. You might build a huge community and then you don't get to interact with them the same way as rules change and, and companies see opportunity, but uh, you gotta kinda keep rolling with it, right? And be consistent and be funny, <laughs> that helps. I think it's also important to have a, uh, a content strategy and a channel strategy as well. So I think a big mistake that a lot of people make is thinking, all right, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's YouTube, there's this, that, and other. I need to be on all of it. You don't. Think about, you know, again, your time is limited. Your money's, you know, finite. So uh, think about what do you want to use these channels for? Is it, is it, fan, is it uh, client acquisition? Is it client retention? Is it, uh, you know, establishing and bolstering your credibility? So, you know, Facebook, again, that, you know, they changed their algorithm, only 1% of, uh, you know, your Facebook community uh, only engages with uh, typically your, your posts. So unless you have money to throw at it, uh, probably not right for you. But maybe client retention, it's the right tool because uh, one thing you can do is make sure your clients are all part of it and then you can obviously, it's, it's a good forum to talk to them. Twitter, um, if it's, again, a build, about building your, you know, fan acquisition and about bolstering your credibility, that's a much more of a public platform and it's a platform that you know you can engage with other influencers. You know, and when influencers engage with you, then they're bringing you know more people, uh, you know, exposing um, you know them to your brand and your your coaching business. So just think about the channels you're using, how you prioritize, and then also the content you're putting on it as well, and give that some thought. Um, anyway, I could go on and on. I'm going to shut up and give these guys a chance. Well, Ali. Well, so I was going to jump in. Uh, Hughes mentioned something about having a content calendar, and I think that's really critical. Break down your posting ideas into categories and make sure that you're hitting on one of those categories each time. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. So it could be the, the easy one they mentioned earlier of, hey, I just read this great article. There's, it's, there's some pros and cons in here about this nutrition plan. What do you guys think? And always ask that question. Facebook and any social platform is a social platform. It's meant to be a dialogue. It's not a pulpit for you to lecture from, so don't think of it that way. End those posts with a question mark. What do you think? Is this a good idea? Do you like this skirt? Do you like eating kale chips? Do you want to run 25 miles a day or 25,000 miles a day? So that idea of engaging them in a dialogue gets them liking and gets them responding, and that also helps boost your relevance and your exposure within Facebook. So it, they're, Facebook looks for um, level of engagement, just like Google looks for level of engagement. And the more you can get people interacting and having a dialogue, then the higher up the food chain you go in, the, in their publicity world. So. And building off Ali's point is there's, we have a general rule, rule of thumb for a lot of the brand pages that we manage, is, and that is uh, typically 75% of those proactive posts should be triggering that engagement, asking a question, what do you think? You know, what do you do? How do you train? Yep. Who's, who's ready for a run this morning? Who's going out this weekend on a bike ride? And there is a difference. You also mentioned about Facebook groups versus your Facebook posts. So also, we can talk a little bit this afternoon about when to use which tool. Um, but one of the big ahas from the survey that we did with Facebook groups is a lot of that heavy lifting is actually taken off you as a coach. Facebook groups self-motivate. It's an amazing tool to get your existing clients and even the fringe clients who, who are not quite sure they want to commit yet for the season to encourage each other, to throw down the gauntlet about pushing each other harder, to um, share funny stories and jokes about training, to setting up rides and runs for the upcoming weekend. You sit back and let them do all the hard work for you. Um, and it's amazing because everyone's passionate about the sport. It's not just you. Your clients are passionate about the sport, so let them infuse and bubble up and create that energy on your behalf to where you're not constantly having to fill the machine. So how do you do that, Mike? D3 multi-sport. Mm -hmm. How do you constantly feed the machine? Uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do you get the people to feed each other? Well, it's just, you know, um, I, I think it's it, giving people encouragement a lot. If you use in social media, you know, we always give shout-outs to people after races and things like that, if it's a PR or uh, first time, uh, you know, Ironman finisher or whatever it is, that stuff um, helps a lot. And I think people really grab onto that. And once again, it goes back to giving you a little bit of credibility as a coach. And it says, well, these guys know what they're doing. They got a guy across the finish line. That's all I want to do. Or they got a guy to cone on. That's all I want to do. All I want to do, right? Um, but 
um, things like that. Can I go back and ask him a question? Yeah. So on, um, <laughs> you, when you're talking about uh, asking the question in terms of social media, what about uh, I think a statement instead? You know, instead of a would a statement work just as well as a question? It, it depends. I mean, it's a general rule of thumb. Uh, what we've seen is when you when you ask a question, when you incite that engagement, um, we see a lot more engagement as a, as a result. It's as simple as ask, you know, just asking a, asking a question. Gotcha. So yeah, simple answer is yeah, a lot more engagement. It's just like human day-to-day -day correspondence and dialogue. I want to have a hamburger for dinner. Right. That's not much of a conversation no. we just had. No. <laughs> Would you like to go with me to have a hamburger there for dinner? There you go, right. <laughs> and also another another kind of quick tip is mm. is tapping into. Um, you know, there are a lot of, obviously, you guys probably know uh, full well, lots of, obviously, hashtags out there, but uh, hashtags that are on specific days, like Motivation Monday or Throwback Thursday or, uh, you know, what, your weekend workout, you know, those are the three examples that you could really tap into uh, and tap into conversations already happening. This is all about fishing where the fish are. Um, you know, also using those, you know, uh, common, you know, triathlon, triathlete, tri-chat kind of hashtags as well and participating in those conversations. Um, and finally, also, um, also pay attention to when you're posting. Um, again, you guys don't have much time. You want to be most efficient. So people are logging on to social media in the morning, at lunchtime, but most often in the evening. Also, to, to a big extent, weekends as well. So just think about that as well. Uh, you know, interact when people are, uh, are looking at those channels. So it sounds like there's a lot of different things you can do with social. Mike, in your coaching business, how do you budget the time to do the social? Uh, well, these guys hit it on it. <clears throat> Using something like Hootsuite is very easy, and you can lay out a month in advance. And I even talked to Nicole a little bit off offline uh, about this in terms of just taking your 30 days and you know making. We have no problem reposting something that's popular, and, and maybe we do it on the first of the month, the 15th of the month, and the 30th. And maybe it's an athlete profile. Those get big hits for us. People love to read about the athlete of the month for us. Um, they love to read somebody's story where it's, you know, a sap story, whatever, and then they get across the finish line and, and all that stuff. Um, that's great. But using that Hootsuite or something like that, that's free, and you can load up a month. You can, I think you can load up 350 days worth of stuff. If you want to put a tweet out 350 days from where you are, you can actually do that. So that's easy stuff. And, it, you know, you can go through and just create an Excel sheet of what you want the content to be, what it's about, when it's going to go out, and then just load it in, and you're good to go for, you know, the next 30 days. And it's always changing, of course, and you can always go in and tweak it. But not having to worry about that day to day and knowing, like when I get that done, I don't get it done all the time, but when I get it done, it, it, it takes a huge, uh, you know, boulder off my shoulders, so. And just when using the tool, just a quick watch out, and, and I don't think this would ever happen is, um, let's use Boston Marathon as an example. There were many brands who lined up uh, proactive posts ahead of the, the race, and there were a lot of brands who got into some hot water because their automated tweet went out talking about Boston, and then of course there was the tragedy. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're using that kind of tool because you never know, you know what's going to happen. Another quick thought, how many of you have multiple people on your team who need to be communicating or in the know on your calendar? Some of you, many of you, you have coaches and stuff. So at Skirt Sports we use a tool, and it's not perfect and there's probably other tools out there, but the one we use is called Kitchen Table. And um, I think it's just kitchentable.com or you could search it. But it allows you to sign up other people on your team, and then there's all kinds of categories. They can have their own calendar. You can look at the shared calendar. And for Skirt Sports, we base our calendar around email marketing, which is like product launches and um, events, events we do, events that we're affiliated with, um, and, and other big things. And then you put your social media posts according to what you have going on. So it's not just haphazard. But we don't necessarily lead with social media. We lead with the other things we do, and social media follows for us. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you guys have um, kind of influential athletes that you're coaching. Um, you know, working on chocolate milk or even Newton running. You know, we have Crowey, we have Rennie, we have Luke, Mackenzie, and a uh, few others. What we've done with them, which has worked really well for us, and you might want to consider, and it might not be those kinds of levels of pro athletes. It might be, let's say, a member of the media or a blogger. Um, uh, we've done kind of what we call social media takeovers, where we have Crowey take over our Instagram handle for chocolate milk for a day. He's posting pictures of what he's doing throughout the day. And then when people catch on, because and they're catching on especially because he's also interacting through his channels, uh, people jump on this and engagement goes through the roof. Um, doesn't really cost any money. Uh, again, takes the, uh, you know, we don't have to manage it, uh, although we have to oversee it. But again, 
huge engagement, um, help you increase your reach and expose you to new fans, um, and also it alleviates alleviate some of your time as well if someone else is doing it. I think in all this social media discussion, you've all alluded to the content that you create, whether it's questions and then creating conversations or it's that sort of thing where you're using somebody. Content, like what do you create? How do you know when it's work? Content, Ali. So the, the, what's interesting is I think it's the questionnaire noted about 35% of you are currently um, writing a blog. Um, and to me, content is, is one of those pieces that gives you credibility and authority. And, but it's, a, it's definitely a rabbit hole. So be careful as you get sucked down um, into it. Um, because you, want, you need to make a determination at the beginning or at the end of the day, are you a coach or are you a writer? There's a balance between the two. Um, but, but content is definitely one of those pieces that, that again, it, it demonstrates your expertise and it gives you authority with your audience. Um, to me, the other big benefit of content is obviously the shareability. You don't want to write something and then keep it in a drawer. It's the kind of thing where you want to make sure it's up on a blog that you own and host and that other people are linking to it and that you're linking to it as well. So um, to me, it's a reach vehicle, and as much as it's an authority vehicle, so it's both the, the quality of the writing, but also the quantity of the eyeballs that it gets exposed to. And it could be anything. I mean, decide what your wheelhouse is. Is it nutrition? Is it some insight that you have when it comes to training? Is it really the, that the basics of becoming a, a great athlete could boil down to really simple things like getting enough sleep and hydration and diet? You know, then maybe you want to corner the market on those three pieces. Um, you know, in addition to keeping the whip cracked on them. So I, I think the idea is what comes naturally to you as a passion topic, um, set a calendar um, and a chapters that you're going to roll out over the course of the six to 12 months and, and then make sure that people are linking to it. Mike, how do you do that? And with your coaches, do you encourage them to write as well and you right. incorporate that into your social? Absolutely. So one of the things we started doing this year that's really popular is we do a day in the life of the coach. And one of our coaches, uh, he decided he was going to, photograph all of his meals for the day and we put that on Facebook and that was huge. I mean people wanted to see what he made and it was uh, he's actually sitting in the audience over here somewhere, Jim Hallberg. And uh, I, I look, I'm like, God, honey, how come you don't make these meals for us? I mean they're incredible. <laughs> so it got me in a little bit of trouble. But um, no, that kind of content works well. We, so we give that to the coaches to do that. Um, we let the coaches write about what their strengths are. Like, like Alex says, I think you kind of write to what your strengths are. Um, you know, some, uh, we have one coach, he's an older, older guy that uh, he loves to write about just uh, the metrics of everything and the wind in Kona and uh, where he got out in the swim and where that affects the draft. I mean, we wrote this amazing article about it and I'm like, four people are going to read this. But it's amazing stuff, if you're, but very few people are really into that kind of, that deep metric kind of stuff. But, um, you know, writing to your strengths is huge and, uh, and letting the coaches do that. And, you know, we, we have to tidy up the article sometimes once in a while, but otherwise I think it, it's really good for them to get out there and helps them obviously get their credibility too. Nicole, you mentioned email, and I do think you do a great job with email and the content around stories. How do you generate those stories and how do you, is email really the place you put them or have you found other places that work better? Well, it, so a couple years ago we hired consultants. Sorry, Allie. Um, and they were awesome. And some things that they helped us with worked and some things didn't. But one of the things that really worked was uh, helping us figure out 10 years later, who are we today? So you can sit there and you're like, okay, I'm a coach, I do coaching. Yeah, but what do you stand for? And what is your philosophy on coaching? And you've probably talked about that here, but knowing who you are and what you stand for and not wavering from it is really, really important. Yet, 10 years later, you're probably a different person, your organization's different, the world's different, so you have to kind of still keep tabs on it, right? Um, and one of the things that we discovered is that we are, the women who flock to our brand are not the elite women, they're not the most like fashion trendy forward people, they're real women of all shapes, all sizes, and they have a lot to say, and they are breaking down barriers, and, and what they have to say is very inspirational to other real women. So we created a forum, it's just a stories page on our website, and we flush it out through email marketing, which is very important to us. It, it's our number one sales driver, always. Um, through social media, through their social media, through their blogs, through our blog, I mean, it's kind of like everywhere we can get these stories out, we do. 
and um, and it's been incredibly successful. It's about like taking what you stand for and like you said, letting the other people do the work, and it just sort of it just sort of flows. I think coming back to to kind of the content theme, I think there's a common thread here that we're certainly very familiar with, um, and that is when you're creating content, think about all those ways that you can kind of cut up that content um, and leverage it through you know email, through Twitter, through Facebook. So using you know the chocolate milk, you know Mission Apollo when we um, transformed Apollo I know, from Speed Skater to Iron Man last year, you know the the, the centerpiece of the program wa was this kind of long form video. Uh, you know, we were spending days on end with Apollo kind of following his training journey with, with cameras there, capturing it all. But we were also thinking about, um, you know, what were all the other ways to communicate that recovery benefit around chocolate milk through all our other channels. So Instagram, you know, 15-second videos, um, uh, you know, behind-the-scenes photos, those kind of fun, you know, the outtakes and all that kind of stuff. So always be thinking about a lot of the stuff that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and with your clients, if they're willing, is a content opportunity. And think about that content opportunity for all the channels that, that you're currently using because that's an engagement opportunity. And that's, an, that's an opportunity to, to convey who you are, who your brand is, um, uh, you know, reach out to those existing clients and bring in new ones. So always be thinking about, about content in that way. I want to throw out one, one other content category. Nicole kind of touched on this. Um, don't only focus on the science of what you're doing. Um, Any time that you're involved in a passion sport, there are things that you have to give up to do what you love, and that's really interesting content too. So, you know, an, an article on how to explain to your spouse why you're going to be gone every single weekend for the next six months. <laughs> that would be a really interesting article to read. How do you raise athletic children? How do you, how do you get your um, significant other involved in the sport so that you're doing it together? Like, those are really, what are people struggling with? I mean, that could be really interesting stuff. So don't just think um, in terms of, you know, hitting the hard science and feeding them, you know, special fruit shake recipes. It's more like, that's, what's the reality? Because this is, it's a grind, right? You know, and, and sometimes your shorts are going to get in a bunch and be uncomfortable. And how are you going to deal with the rash? You buy a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think, don't, don't take yourself too seriously. Think holistically, lifestyle, about what you are struggling with. Your client's are probably struggling with it, too. And harvest your client base. I mean, that... Yes. It's better to tell those stories than them. Like yeah. my, my wife, she could tell that, that story. Well, how wonderful would it be that the article was written from the triathlete widow or widower? I mean, wouldn't that be a great story? <laughs> Nicole, you mentioned the brand that you create and really thinking about what that's going to be 10 years down the road. Hugh, one of your specialties really is on brand building. How do you build that brand? What do you think about whether you're starting out now or whether you're 10 years down the road already? So uh, I always think back when I think brand building to when I first started in PR um, just a few years ago. Um, <laughs> my boss told me that you know, the, the, the benefits of a strategically defined brand um, are very similar to when you know, two people fall in love with each other. Um, you, know, you, you, you fall for the, for the same values, the same beliefs, uh, the sense of humor, you know, everything about that person. Um, and then you go off and make babies, but um, not suggesting that to you coaches. But, um, but I think that's, uh, um, that, that's definitely uh, kind of a, a good mindset to, to remember. Um, uh, but I think what you really need to do is kind of pinpoint what your mission is um, and ask yourself, you know, why did you get into this business? What do you stand for? What is your personality? What's your kind of specialty? What's your magic source? Um, and then think about how are you going to convey that in a way that's very distinct, very you, um, to help you kind of stand out from the competition, to help you, um, you know, to help people fall in love with you guys. Um, so, so think about uh, your brand. Um, think about, the, ask yourself those questions, and think about your brand as a person. You know, each person has a personality, um, the way they dress, the way they speak, um, and everything you do as a business, um, um, kind of bring it back to that. And don't forget, um, I, I think it's easy for, for, for business and business owners to, to think about just their own business. Um, and I, but I think it's very healthy to take yourself out and become uh, and think, of, think like the client. Uh, what, would, what would you want? What do you want to see? Um, you know, 
can't tell you how many times I flick through a, you know, a magazine, uh, particularly in this space, unfortunately, where you, know, you see this little ad, it's usually towards the back of the magazine, where who is this brand? Why are they for me? What, what even is this product? Um, so really taking the time to kind of pinpoint your mission, uh, define, your, define that mission and your personality and what you stand for, how you stand out above the competition um, really goes a long way. And just touching on the competition, it also um, is beneficial just to kind of look at who else is out there, um, what do they stand for, how are they engaging um, uh, with their clients, what mistakes are they making that I could learn from. Um, so at the end of the day, what you have is a very clearly articulated uh, kind of mission. You have a personality. Uh, you have a distinct uh, kind of uh, set of values uh, and services so that um, you know, your clients and potential clients know who you stand for. Um, and the important thing is it must be authentic. You must follow through on what, how you're positioning your brand. Mike, in 15 years of building a brand with D3 Multisport. Just my head spinning for everything you just said. Today. <laughs> what lessons have you learned, though, in building that brand? Uh, exactly what he talked about. You have an identity. Um, you have a philosophy you stick to. You know, for us, it's integrity, honesty, and all that stuff. Um, I, we've had athletes, you know, been caught drafting and have a conversation with them. And I'm like, you, you have our uniform on? I don't want you drafting. That's not part of the sport, right? And, uh, you know, we sever those relationships with those athletes. I don't care how good they are. We don't want them you know, out there doing that and, and putting our, our name in a, in a bad spot. Oh, that guy's on that team, they all draft or something like that. So and the integrity and, and finding, you know, figuring out what your, your mission is and, and sticking to it. And, and Nicole said before, like just being consistent with everything. I think that's a big piece of it. Um, it you know, and for us, it's just, uh, yeah, it's sticking with the mission. And it's been the same for 15 years. And I think that's part of, you know, being partially successful. I want to jump to a question because I know that, at least looking at the survey, <laughs> This is the number one thing that people do to market your coaching business, word of mouth. Without talking about social media, because we just talked about that a lot, and content, what word of mouth tactics or strategies have you been able to leverage in your business or ideas that you might have that would work for coaches? Uh, yeah, this is a big one. So I keep track of every person that contacts us and how they contact us, whether it's through Training Peaks or social media or whatever. Word of mouth is... 85% of how we get our business. Um, and, and I think it's just everything I just talked about. It's, it's, it's just being honorable with people. It, you know, if people don't have a right fit with a coach, then you know, we give them their money back and they go on their way. And, and, and that trickles down to they tell their friends that, yeah, I, I work with them and maybe it didn't work out for me, but it might work for you. And when you're honest and honorable, I think that really helps your, your brand quite a bit. Um, but the word of mouth piece, um, it, it's really just, you know, some of it is just presence at a sport, at, at an event, being out there, and people see you out there supporting your athletes, and the word of mouth is, oh, those guys are always out there. You know, Mile Hill Multisport, I always see them in all races, and, and Pete Alfino is a good friend of mine. Um, things like that, when you see that, you, you start to say, well, those, the, the, it trickles, and you can hear it in the circles that, um, you know, this guy, this, this is a good group over here, or maybe this isn't a good group over here, but those things, and especially living in the bubble in Boulder, you, you know what's going on, and, and you get the pulse on it, but, um, and that's why, for me, you know, you have to be honest, and you have to be honorable, otherwise, People will know pretty quickly, they'll see through it. It's pretty transparent, right? You know, I want to just add to that. Um, so you're one person, and eventually then you hire some people. I think that's another question coming up. Um, but, you know, I know people will like skirt sports if they make me because I'm so likable. How could you not like me? Hello. But, you know, I'm going to give them a good experience, right? But then I hire people. and they have to also give them that same experience. So it goes all the way back to what he was saying about making sure that, every, number one thing, become a great hirer. I, have, I was a bad hirer. I learned how to become a good hirer. I try very hard to get great people on board, and sometimes they're not the perfect fit for the job, and they can be trained, and sometimes, you know, it's, so you, you need to have people who are aligned with you. But those are the people now who, when people meet them, that's who they're associating with your company. It's not just you anymore. And as you grow, and many of us, and you're here because you probably want to grow your business, um, you're probably looking at that. So becoming a great hirer, finding those great people who are going to be able to spread the message almost as good as you can yourself is, I think, really important for word of mouth. Allie, what's your advice? Yeah, I, I, I'm sometimes worried when I hear things, um, when I hear the phrase word of mouth, because it sounds really passive to me, and it sounds like fingers crossed marketing. So I'm okay with word of mouth when it is purposeful, planned out, 
proactive word of mouth. I mean, the reality is in the ski business, the number one influencer on where you're going to take your ski vacation is friends and family. I mean, it's word of mouth, but it doesn't mean that we can, you know, pick up our skis and go skiing and not market anymore. I mean, you still have to think about how do you encourage word of mouth? And it's totally what Mike said. I mean, you've got to have a quality product and you've got to have a quality staff and you've got to have a quality service. But how do you encourage word of mouth? How do you um, reach out to the editors of the local papers and make sure that they're talking about you when it's appropriate and working you into editorial? Reaching out to the clubs and making sure like, hey, can I give you some uh, free content for your club newsletter? How do you talk to your own clients and say, do you know anyone else? Simple question, do you know anyone else that could possibly use um, our service? Are you happy? Are you happy? Did you get out of this what you wanted to get out of this and would you refer us? So word of mouth is like sort of a, to me, the lowest barrier of entry. We all need word of mouth, but you can't, can't cross your fingers. You've got to think in terms of how do you proactively encourage it? How do you foster it? How do you reward it? There was a lot of you guys I was impressed with that actually have formalized referral programs. Now, You've got to be comfortable that you're worth referring, so make sure you check that box first. <laughs> but assuming that you feel like you've got a quality product and you've got happy customers, push. Push them, help them help you grow your business. That's, that's planned word of mouth. Hugh, you've done a lot with word of mouth. I mean, a lot of it through the social and you know, through some of these campaigns. What advice? So we've, um, chocolate milk and Newton, I guess, are two good examples where uh, Newton especially you have this tribe of, of runners, athletes, triathletes who love the shoe and when they see someone else wearing uh, a pair of Newtons they you know typically go up and talk to them and go hey do you like your Newtons? Um, so there you have a, a brand it's a good product it's, um, th they've done a really good job of, of making a really authentic and meaningful connection um, with the tribe um, mostly through social media but also um, offline as well, you know, for instance, in Kona uh, a couple of years ago, and I think uh, again last year, um, again, they, for, for any athletes who were there in Kona wearing their shoes, you know, there was a, you know, a happy hour in, in one of the bars there, or, you know, they were running down Ali Drive and, uh, you know, Newton folks were roaming around throwing him a water bottle. It's a way to make them feel appreciated to say, hey, this brand loves me, um, and that makes them feel really good and, and to talk about uh, the brand. Chocolate milk, same thing. We have a, uh, about 160 brand ambassadors now uh, on team chocolate milk. Again, same approach. Uh, we, c we, we know who's racing and when, um, and we congratulate them. We engage with them. We make them feel you know, loved, uh, and we have this authentic relationship. And as a result, they're out there. They're talking about us uh, to, to uh, potential chocolate milk drinkers as well as other uh, team chocolate milk members as well. So it's that authentic relationship making them feel, you know, feel loved, basically. And I would guess that every single one of your clients is a brand ambassador for you and for your coaching business. Nicole touched on the point, when you're just a one-person shop, you can control the quality. As you scale up your business, as you add coaches, as you hire what are the tricks to scale it up? And Nicole, you started talking about it a little bit, but let's start with Mike. So you've gone from one coach to 15 coaches. Right. You've hired additional nutrition and other uh, you know, coaches along with that too. How have you done that? Sure, so uh, learn from my mistakes. That's the first thing, and that's part of my presentation at 3.30. Um, a big piece of it was, is just having systems in place and knowing you know, where they fit in, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And you know, like Nicole said, you, you may go through all this stuff and then hire the wrong person. And, and I've done that many times. Um, and I've had a complete turnover of coaches in the last uh, four years. And I, I, I say this every day, I'm, I'm totally blessed now with the coaches I have because they're all awesome and they're incredible and they're great. And five years ago, I couldn't say that. And you know, it's nothing against those coaches, they just weren't a good fit for what we were trying to do. And you know, just like every company has you know, a, a revolving door at sometimes, it just, you gotta turn over people and you need new blood. But it's really important finding the right people for the job and what you want to do, what your mission is, and what you want to accomplish. And if you can do that, it makes things a lot easier. You're not dealing with headaches of you really getting to build a business versus dealing with, oh, this client's not happy, that client's not happy, you got to return this, you know, all that stuff. So it's really just being particular about who you want to work with and that they, their personality fits in with what you want to do, what you're trying to accomplish. Ali, how do you advise new businesses that are in that process of scaling up their marketing? You know, unless, 
Uh, it's kind of what Ms. Uh, Nicole touched on earlier is handing over your brand voice to um, someone else's, uh, it's very scary. So unless you truly have someone that you feel 100% comfortable, it is your sister, your spouse, your best friend, but you've got someone who you know can be as articulate about your brand as you are, you, know, you, you may want to try out a couple different um, contractors. So that could be, um, I mean, it could be a blogger, it could be um, a, a, an actual marketer, it could be a consultant, it could be an agency. But before you hire someone in-house and take on that burden, because that's kind of scary, right? You're responsible for this person's living. So you know, unless you have that perfect person in mind, you may want to think about um, outsourcing from a marketing perspective, um, even if it's just finding you know, a graphic designer and a, and a strategist combination. But try to find that person um, who can work with you part-time, because I'd rather get stellar part-time creative than mediocre full-time creative that now, when it doesn't work out, I have to fire them. So I would slowly scale up to full-time in-house employment, personally. And that was not a plug for me. I'm just thinking that's the safest way. <laughs> uh, so you guys have, you know, sound like all the experience, expertise you built up over the time. I'm guessing, only a guess, but there may have been one, maybe one failure along the way. Can you share with us what that might have been and what you learned from it and how you reacted to it and how it made it better? Or maybe you just forgot about it. <laughs> Therapy. <laughs> uh, Nicole. Um, <clears throat> I fail all the time, constantly. It's, uh, it's a constant. The thing about what I do, and I, I'm not exactly sure how it will relate, so there's some, somewhere in here it will, but you're always wrong. It's just a matter of how close you are to not being, like how close to right you are. So think about the inventory that we have to order. So wouldn't it be awesome if I could order like 10,000 skirts and then I sell the very last one in the whole warehouse the day the next batch comes in? But it just isn't like that. I mean, you've got, you're, you have a miss here and there. So there's, it's, it's a constant state of doing things wrong. Um, I've had some big, mess ups in the past and many of them have had to do with not doing due, uh, due diligence on partners and things like that so if you're working with I don't know check your contracts check your agreements check your liability uh, all that stuff can come back to get you especially when you start hiring people too um, and then we've had some real misses with uh, products and even events that we've done We've had things that were a smashing success for years and then suddenly turned the tide and went down the dumper. Do you guys remember our Skirt Chaser series? It's like the most amazing race you've ever done. And we did it for seven or eight years and the first five years it was like, we can't do anything, everything I touch turns to gold. You know, it was like, can't do anything wrong. And then something changed in the events industry and there were other things for people to do and they just stopped coming. And, Seeing when you're starting to slip down that slippery slope, is a, it's, hard, it's hard to see that. But to be able to recognize it and cut ties while you still can and then move on to the next thing, that's an important lesson. It's just like knowing your nutrition in a race, right? Once you bonk, you're done. You gotta sit on the side of the road for an hour. Um, so yeah, that's my little relative term for all of you athletes. <laughs> Hugh. Uh, an F up story that I'd learned from. Um, a few years ago, we shot a, uh, a Got Milk ad with Chris Bosch, a milk moustache ad. Uh, we wanted to convey uh, the, the kind of the bone building benefits of drinking milk. So, Chris Bosch, tall guy, basketball player, in case you didn't know, um, we shot a print ad with him and a baby giraffe. Giraffes are tall. Kind of Chris and baby giraffe kind of tells that bone building story. So the, the campaign was great, you know, and, um, but when we launched it, we thought, wouldn't it be a good idea? And this, we launched it at the NBA All-Star Game. Um, very, very crowded environment. And uh, we thought, wouldn't it be a good idea if we brought back the giraffe and actually unveiled this you know, huge blow up of this print ad uh, with the giraffe? Yes. And um, anyway, uh, Chris Bosch is there, he's waiting, massive crowds all waiting in, in anticipation. Um, we're ready for the giraffe to come out. We had, no, this was a few months down the line from shooting the ad. Giraffe comes out, it's about three times the size as it was <laughs> when we shot uh, the ad. And uh, suddenly the giraffe sees all these crowds and um, TMZ said, 
giraffe goes berserk. <laughs> at, at uh, so um, that was a little bit of a. Uh, <laughs> so I guess the lesson learned: don't work with baby giraffes. <laughs> wow. Everyone will take that home. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll throw a funny one out there. Um, we, in the ski industry, uh, at least at Vail, we spend a lot of time um, not concentrating on snow at, at Vail. Um, snow is a very fickle thing. And without getting involved in um, the stats over global warming, the reality is sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't. And if you sell snow, um, you're really on a very slippery slope, no pun intended. So uh, we actually focused on the whole experience. And we spent a lot of time focused on the whole experience um, and, and what, the, um, what the target audience would get out of that. And snow was just part of it. And then Steamboat came out with champagne powder. And we're like, what is, you can't own champagne powder. That's ridiculous. That's the most unownable thing on the planet. And then they trademarked it. And we went berserk. We were like, this, I can't believe they're actually fighting us on snow. They've like trademarked this. And people are loving it. They're just totally talking about their champagne powder all the time. And we just completely became obsessed over this concept that they could own something that was not ownable. And we, com we just lost our minds over this competitive thing that they had pulled out of thin air and put a trademark on. And it was so such a waste of time because we were doing the right thing. We were focused on our overall experience and what the benefit is to the guest. And don't get involved in a fight over snow, whether you call it champagne powder or blower powder or snorkel powder or whatever you want to call it. Like, it doesn't matter because what happens if it's not there when Bill and Susie show up and they're going to be really pissed off. Uh, but we, needless to say, we spent a lot of time obsessing over the competition and over, off of, uh, over a point that they were making that we had already made a conscious decision that we didn't want to go down that path. And the minute they, like, through the bone, like a bunch of dogs, we ran after it. <laughs> and it took us a while to get all the dogs back in the doghouse and refocused on um, our core values and our core beliefs and our salient points of differentiation when it came to our audience. But it was, um, it was an interesting lesson. And still, it still stings. Every single time you open Ski Magazine and you see that line, it, it still stings. But stay the course. Therapy, right? Yeah, therapy, lots of therapy. <laughs> Obviously, I'm still working through that. <laughs> Mike. Uh, mine's more of a serious, um, he had a great story, she had a great story, a great story. <laughs> Mine was more of a serious thing. I had hired a group at one point, we were working on our CRM, um, which is customer relation management, and we, we hired a company to, do, to use uh, some new software and got about six to eight months in and tons of money into it and realized it was just a real bad fit. They'd really understand endurance athletes. and So those are mistakes that, you know, just vetting people right and getting the right people to help you out and especially... Um, I kind of jumped in. It was one of those things. I was like, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to blow my business up and just kind of backfired a bit. So that was a little setback, but got with the right people now, and things are a lot better. So just kind of learn from your mistakes and move on. Yeah, no, that's a good one because that can cost a lot of money yep. too.